Uh, here to the uh, little bit of a strip of the what's called the Old Wahatchee Pike. Uh, we're parked back here in back of the uh, Sky Harbor Inn. Um, and I do want to just extend a really quick thanks to them. They did give us permission to kind of park back here and muddy up their back lot a little bit. So uh, uh, so, so thanks to them. Um, uh, which I think, I think Rock City is actually owns who recently wow. purchased this now. So, um, so I was very excited that they allowed us to do this. Um, this is a public trail that we're going to be on. So this is something you can hike on anytime you want. Um, and it is a relatively short hike. Um, just a couple of logistics, safety type things. What we're going to do is we're going to walk down this kind of old gravel road, old, old paved road. Um, it's out just under a half mile, four tenths, a little over. Um, and then we'll come back um, at uh, four or five points along the way. We'll kind of stop. I'll share some, some stories. Some of it's going to be historical. Some of it's just going to be bad jokes. Um, <laughs> and uh, for those of y'all that have been on my tours, you know that I have a healthy dose of those. Um, so, uh, and then when we get back, um, as I said, just as, as just a general safety thing, we're, we're getting out of here. Um, because this is a pretty narrow road, we're just all going to have to be kind of patient. What we're going to have to do is kind of pull in, back out, and snake out just kind of one at a time. And it'll, it'll take us a few minutes, but, uh, um, but I think we'll, we'll all be all right. Does anybody have questions, comments, or concerns on that? All right. Well, very cool. Well, um, let's get out on the trail a little bit. We'll do kind of our intro stuff from there. So let's start walking. All right. Get everybody kind of back in earshot here. So one of the things I'm not used to having to do on hikes on the mountain is to talk loudly over interstate traffic. But that's going to be a thing for this whole time. Uh, and so I say that just to point out, if you need me to be louder, please let me know. I can always be louder. Um, before I became a park ranger, uh, I was a high school history teacher and baseball coach. Uh, and I did theater as a hobby. I can be plenty loud enough. So again, if you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, for those of you guys that have been on some of my, uh, my hikes and tours before, uh, you know that one of the things that I often do is instead of me carrying around big old pictures and maps to show you, is I print out little things to pass out to you guys. Um, I've got about 20 copies of this or so. I've got more people here than I've got copies. So if we just kind of pass these around, maybe kind of like one per party, one per group, um, and we'll kind of go from there. So this is just going to be some cool historic images to line up uh, some things that we're looking at as well as some maps. Um, and I'll kind of reference a few of these things. We'll give those a second to, uh, to get out and about there. Right. Has everybody got where you kind of sort of see one of those now? Okay, very cool. So, um, where we're gathered, it's not, I mean, it is a trail because it's closed to vehicle traffic, but open to foot traffic. But until relatively recently, this was a paved road. Uh, called the Old Wahatchee Pike. Um, this road uh, stretches from kind of at the intersection here with the uh, uh, the Sky Harbor Inn and goes all the way down and eventually will link up with Broad Street. So if you uh, um, if you're familiar, if you're coming down south, if you're coming down Broad Street south towards Lookout Mountain, for those of you guys that are familiar with the area, um, if you kind of turn right, like you're going to come up Cummins Highway here behind us. Um, that's one way to go. Or if you were to kind of turn left, you actually kind of wiggle up um, and you'll, you'll hit the end of this trail um, at one point. So this stretch of road is actually an original, kind of by original, I mean 200 year old uh, road trace uh, that's still kind of in its original configuration. And what's really cool about this is it's one of our few kind of original roads that's around here that doesn't run through the middle of town or isn't a, a, a trail that you gotta go take it off through the middle of the woods. Um, to, to get to. Um, so this road, the Wahatchee Pike, um, just a really quick kind of background on kind of why these roads were created um, uh, in the early 1800s. So in 1803, and this is also the part where we'll remind everybody, um, we are not at school. I said I used to be a history teacher, I'm not anymore, so I'm not going to be grading your papers. So don't freak out about names and dates you don't have to memorize. Sound fair to everybody? Great. So in 1803, uh, the United States government purchased a huge swath of land uh, from France, the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and that kind of triggers this massive uh, kind of influx of westward migration in the United States. Opens up new territories uh, for settlement, for trade. A lot of these new territories, this was not part of the Louisiana Purchase right here, but a lot of these new territories were situated in American Indian uh, lands. Um, and so what had been going on was a lot of the American Indian groups uh, throughout, particularly the Southeast, had these kind of existing trade routes. Um, some of them were relatively famous. 
uh, the Great War Path, one is called. Um, and a lot of these kind of pass through this area. Um, and so in, after the United States purchases, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, a couple of years later, a couple, a few years later, about a decade later, we fight a war with England, the War of 1812. Now you weren't expecting to come up here and listen to hear about the War of 1812 today. Um, in the aftermath of the War of 1812, there's kind of this fit of American nationalism. Our nation's leaders kind of looked and said, you know what, we need to be able to uh, better respond if we're ever invaded again. That was kind of one of the things that, that came out of that war. They said, we need to be able to better respond, but also if we're going to compete with countries like Great Britain, we need to become kind of this industrial and economic powerhouse. And so this thing emerged called the American system, um, which is kind of the uh, the brainchild of a, uh, of a very prominent early 19th century politician, a guy named Henry Clay. Um, and what the American system was, um, to use modern terminology, it is kind of, it is big government to use modern terminology, but the American system kind of has three uh, components to it. Um, they were going to pass a strong protective tariff, and the purpose of that would be to raise funds and protect American industries, uh, particularly in the Northeast, places like New England, uh, New York, that area, um, and to try to help them be able to compete with British uh, manufacturing. They would also create a national banking system to help fund all of this stuff. And third, most important for kind of where we are, they would use federal subsidies, government subsidies, to fund infrastructure projects, roads, rail, not rail, not quite, but rail's coming, uh, canal systems. And so they begin this massive road uh, construction project. And most of this is just picking up existing uh, Indian roads, and even some other, other already government-run roads that, that, are, that are out there. Uh, most famous of those in this area is, of course, the Federal Road that, uh, that kind of crosses Bacchus and Bend back behind us here, cut out uh, across Georgia um, a little bit. Uh, but kind of in the midst of that, uh, this Wahatchee Pike kind of emerges as this important uh, thoroughfare. Now, if you're looking at your packet here, and you're looking on the front cover here, beneath the lovely picture taken on a much sunnier day on this road. Um, if you're looking underneath here, um, this is a map uh, from Civil War era, so you will see some, some there. If you look really closely, you'll see something on there about Rosecrans Battlefield. We'll get to that later. But uh, but it does show you kind of all of the roads here around the area um, in the mid-1860s. And what I've done is I've taken a little pen and kind of colored in all of these roads to show you just why this stretch of road, the old Wahatchee Pike, that's going to connect Chattanooga to Lookout Valley may be the most important of the roads in this area. So, if you're looking at this, what is kind of the Wahatchee Pike linking into the Federal Road is kind of highlighted in blue here. Yellow is the Lafayette Road, and I kind of threw that in there for all you guys that are big Chickamauga Civil War battle folks. You know, you can see the Lafayette Road. And then all the red is kind of these other, other major roads that are crossing through the area. The big geographic feature here, the two big geographic features here, are the Tennessee River that's right beneath us. In the early 1800s, you're not going to put a bridge across this. And the other big geographic feature, is this mountain we're standing on, Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really a mountain in the sense that you would think of if you've ever been to say like Colorado or somewhere. It's a big ridge that stretches from a point where we're at, stretches back to the southwest, back into Alabama about 80 miles. So to make a very long story kind of short, if you're going to cross from east to west, you kind of have to cross at the foot of Lookout Mountain. And so this road that crosses along the lower slope becomes this major thoroughfare. If you're moving from the, from the north trying to get down into Alabama, so we'll use our little map here. You're coming down one of these red lines here. You cross at Ross's Landing and you're trying to get out into Alabama, you have to come down here and come up the Wahatchee Pike, pick up that blue route and come out into Lookout Valley. All right. So. The, this road, this geography creates, and I'm going to quote our park historian Jim Ogden, who several of you guys know, he often refers to, to this place as being, uh, or Chattanooga as being uh, a gateway, a passageway, a doorway to the deep south. That is because of this road. This road is 
kind of that doorway. And so we're gonna do is we're gonna as we kind of walk down the doorway here, we're gonna stop and share some stories of people and, and goods moving up and down this road, uh, both before, during, and after the Civil War. In the late summer of 1863, during the American Civil War, both armies, Union and Confederate forces, wanted to control the city of Chattanooga right here. And we can kind of see why that is from here. If you look down just this way through the trees, you can see, and Paul, I think you were just asking about this, uh, some train tracks down here. Now, now there's a lot more tracks that are here now than there were during the Civil War, but that was, there were train tracks at the base of the mountain here. The Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad connected. Well, there's points you get those two cities that connects. Nashville and Chattanooga, that is the one I'm afraid to pick up. All right, I lied to you guys. So, the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, uh, that's going to go up into the city of Chattanooga. In Chattanooga, you pick up the Western and Atlantic. I mean, this is a huge crossroads. In the late summer of 1863, though, the Union Army of the Cumberland, under the command of a guy named William Rosecrans, they are up in the area up around Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, they had fought, there had been a big battle there in uh, December of 62 into January of 1863, the Battle of Stones River. Um, and the Confederates had retreated back towards Tullahoma. Well, in the late summer, President Lincoln has given orders to General Rosecrans. You guys need to go capture Chattanooga, capture Chattanooga, capture Chattanooga. Well, excuse me. What that kind of turns into is Rosecrans waits a little bit. He doesn't go immediately. But in June and July, he starts maneuvering south uh, and effectively just kind of outmaneuvers the Confederates out of Middle Tennessee. For those of you guys that are really big Civil War buffs, we call this the Tullahoma Campaign. Um, and the Confederates retreat into the city of Chattanooga. Now, from this vantage point, we can kind of see. So put yourself in General Rosecrans' shoes. You're coming from the north. What's stopping you from attacking Chattanooga straight from the north? Mountain, Signal Mountain, Walden's Ridge, this river back here. And so what General Rosecrans decides to do is that they're gonna kind of swing around, use Lookout Mountain as kind of a screen, swing around to the south and cross uh, the Tennessee, or excuse me, cross uh, Lookout Mountain and try to swing up and capture Chattanooga, which is right out here. They're going to try to capture it from the south. What General Rosecrans does is because these mountain passes are so narrow, he can't put the whole army through one pass. Raise your hand if you've ever been stuck in traffic on I-24. Okay, everybody who lives here has been stuck on I-24. What gets us stuck on I-24 is the same thing that keeps General Rosecrans from putting his whole army through any one particular spot. There's just not enough room. The roads are narrow. You're bottled in by all the mountains, the river. And so what he does is he sends uh, General Alexander McCook's 20th Corps. And this is again the part where I remind you there's not a test on Corps and Corps commanders or anything like that. Um, they swing way around to the south, back down through Winston's Gap. If you know where like Menlo is in that area, they're going to swing all the way down there and then try to come up. And that's kind of marked with this blue line. Um, he sends General George Thomas and the 14th Corps. They all cross at Bridgeport, Alabama, and they're going to swing through uh, what's called Stevens Gap. To give you a little bit of an idea of where that is, that's Macklemore's Cove. That's about maybe, if you know where Chickamauga Battlefield is, 10, 15 miles south of Chickamauga Battlefield, kind of in that area. What General Thomas and General McCook's <laughs> objective is to do is to swing south and to force General Braxton Bragg and the Confederate Army of Tennessee to retreat south out of the city. And then he's got Thomas Crittenden and the men of the 21st Corps. They are waiting kind of to pounce on that. And what their mission is, they're out on Lookout Valley here, and what they're supposed to do is then come up, cross the front face of Lookout Mountain, and occupy the city of Chattanooga. And that's kind of what happens. The 1st of September of 1863, you've got the 14th Corps, the 20th Corps way south. That forces Bragg to retreat just as they intended. And just about the entirety of Thomas Crittenden's 21st Corps crosses Lookout Mountain. Now there's not a road at the bottom of the mountain down back then. There is no I-24 to walk on. This is the road. The entirety of Thomas Griffin's 21st Corps marches 
to Chattanooga on this road that is no wider than what we're standing right here. And a kind of personal fun story for me is my civil, one of my Civil War ancestors is with that outfit, so that's kind of cool to be standing here. Uh, and so they come through here, uh, they, uh, they captured Chattanooga uh, on the uh, early September. Um, now, this is kind of ultimately what leads to the Battle of Chickamauga, though. The Confederates have retreated south, Crittenden's troops move in, capture the city of Chattanooga, and then move south, and then you have this huge battle down there. And then the Union Army retreats after they're defeated back into the city. You can kind of see all of that from here. So, this road, the old Wahatchee Pike connecting the city of Chattanooga to Lookout Valley, uh, was kind of the major road, uh, one of the major roads in this area for a very long time. Now, in the mid 20th century, early to mid 20th century, as Chattanooga kind of turned into this big tourist destination, uh, our two big famous tourist destinations, aside from the National Military Park, being of course Rock City and Ruby Falls, Ruby Falls kind of has a hidden stepsister, we'll call it. So to use a little bit of a Cinderella analogy, Ruby Falls is the stepsister that Cinderella is still uh, waiting for her day to get to come out. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be anytime soon. Right underneath us uh, is uh, the entrance to uh, what is called Mystery Falls. Now you can't get in there, it's private property. Um, it's been completely like concrete blocked up. Um, I'll show you the cap up here uh, in just a second. So don't worry, you aren't going to get into it anytime soon. Um, but this was, um, what it is, is this, this huge underground waterfall, very similar to Ruby Falls. Um, a little bigger, um, to be honest really? with you. Yeah, wow. um, a little bigger, um, but slightly, <laughs> that's an understatement there, slightly more dangerous to access. Um, in the, in the, it was first kind of found in the late 1880s. Um, Robert Cravens, who uh, owned the Cravens house up on the mountain up above us, um, was, was involved. Um, it's kind of some of the early development of trying to get access to Mystery Falls. Um, and there was this, and you kind of see the picture here, um, this hit from, from the 1880s obviously, but there was these big efforts to kind of create this elevator system to get people down here to see the cave, to see the falls. Um, just wasn't as easily accessible as Ruby Falls um, was. And uh, it was eventually finally closed off um, in the uh, first in the mid 19, late 1950s. Um, I think the total number of fatalities for people trying to go spelunking on their own was something like five or six. Um, and so um, with that, I'm, I'm gonna actually kind of stop talking about uh, Mystery Falls for just a second because, and I, this was a complete surprise, so if, I'm, if, if you want me to, if, if you, can, you can slap me with your walking stick if you want to. We've actually got somebody here um, who's actually been in there um, before, um, bef with permission, let me clarify that. Um, and so, Mr. Doug, do you, you, you want to tell everybody a little bit about Mystery yeah. Falls, like what it's like? I am a past member of the Helena County Cave and Cliff Rescue Team, and Mystery Falls is the tallest waterfall pit in Tennessee. And it's just pretty much right directly behind us in the mountain right here. When they uh, were doing the exploration, they could crawl and wade and do a short swim and come into this giant cave with a waterfall at the top. And they had engineers and surveyors went in and surveyed that. And then they surveyed up the mountain and dug a, pat, a, a pit down and only missed this cave by about 10 feet. They intersected a side passage on it. Uh, this picture that you've got right there was a, a, in, in the middle, right here, was a mule-driven windlass that lowered you down 286 feet next to a giant waterfall in a barrel. The barrel is still in the bottom of the cave down there, what's left of it. It's, 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 it's eroded. So that must have been quite a ride. Uh, I, uh, if you can just imagine a two liter Coke bottle that's 300 feet tall, that's what Mystery Falls looks like from there. These pictures just can't really even give you an idea how massive this hole is in the side of the mountain. And uh, when they put the train tunnel in that uh, cut off Old Lookout Mountain Caverns, it come within just a few yards of the bottom of Mystery Falls and when a train goes through, if you're waiting for your buddies to climb, you can feel the mountain shake from that. So, but it occasionally floods and runs over the top of the dam and water squirts out here and runs off down the side of the mountain. 
and it is an amazing waterfall to see it fall 300 feet in there. It really is. But none of us are ever going to get to see it. You have to do a the only place, the only way to access the bottom is to repel and then climb back up the road. But it's a shame it's closed off. Yes, they're working on that. They're working on that. They're working the, the, a little bit the, of that. The, land, the landowners, there's some delicate relations going on, so. Oh. <laughs> there, there are certainly, I'm sure, people that are not thrilled that I'm even standing here talking about it. So, yeah. so when they surveyed in from the bottom down there, they had no idea where this falls was coming from. They, they could measure where the bottom of the falls was, but the brightest light that they had in 1887 wouldn't even start to shine with the top of the pit. It's just like the, it was coming out of the dark sky. So, that's a good name. I'm glad you're here. That was that like that was a better story than what I'm gonna tell. <laughs> I'm like trying to describe it from black and white yeah. photos, and you're going, it's yeah, cool. There's a masonry dam in, in there that's got a, a, a place where you can plug it plug it up. So to repel it and climb it, you'd have your buddies close up the hole in the dam, and it would cut the waterfall off for a few minutes while you repelled and took off climbing as hard as you could. The the water line came out right here, and until the, the pollution became a problem here on the mountain, it was the water supply for uh, St. Elmo at the base of the mountain. Well, you're a serious All right, so kind of jumping back to our Civil War story a little bit, that path that we just have walked from the Sky Harbor Inn to the barricades here uh, is kind of this original segment of the old Wahatchee Pike, the, the major thoroughfare, the major road to connect the city of Chattanooga to Lookout Valley. Again, the entirety of the Union Army's 21st Corps um, passes through here. Um, and so where this road goes, to kind of give you a sense of where we fit into the grand scheme of things, and as we can see, people used to live here as well. Um, this was kind of, uh, you know, in, in the, the, throughout a lot of the late 1800s, um, this road was, again, kind of that major road uh, back and forth. As I said, the Union Army's 21st Corps keeps on going down here uses this road as their access into Chattanooga, capture Chattanooga in early September, um, and then uh, after their defeat at Chickamauga, the whole army retreats to Chattanooga. And this road is gonna become vitally important once again. Immediately after the Battle of Lookout Mountain, a, uh, or excuse me, immediately after the Battle of Chickamauga, said that backwards, um, right after the Battle of uh, Chickamauga, um, uh, Union forces, a small group of Tennessee Unionists under the command of a guy named James Spear um, come to capture uh, Lookout Mountain. To, and they're not trying to hold the high ground. They're not trying to hold the top of the mountain. They know that this road is the vital supply link. And so his Tennessee uh, troopers are right here where we're gathered um, trying to hold the road to make sure that the Confederates don't cut off anything. And here's why this road is going to be important for the Union Army during the Civil War. The Army's in the city of Chattanooga. Their supply base is back at Bridgeport, Alabama. The only way to get between point A to point B is either up that windy road going up Signal Mountain, which is way out of the way, so far out of the way that you can't, like you, 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 you're, you're expending more supplies to take that route than you're actually able to bring in, or to come right down this road. And so this road is gonna become uh, the, the, the source of, of a good deal of, uh, not necessarily heavy fighting, but, but some maneuvering back and forth um, throughout the siege of Chattanooga in October of 1863. I was up here with John Wilson. We were looking for the 1820s road that actually went above here. Yeah. That uh, Jackson would have taken his troops down there to, uh, if the creeks did rise. Right. It was the Creek Indians he was talking about. Anyway, we're up and we've Phil, we found that, and I've been very interested in Civil War history. This little museum has been the family for okay. four or five generations. Uh, so I have all these Civil War maps, uh, and was able, you can't, of course, dig in the park at all, right. but uh, were we to decide to do that? But I had John with me, and we came across this trench that went up and down the road, which is just down here. Right. 
He said, John, this doesn't look natural. This isn't a waterway. This has got to be a trench from the from the battle. Oh no, darn, it's not on any of the maps. And I took the uh, Civil War maps that I had and blew them up on computer and overlaid the maps. And so Jim Ogden, who's a dear friend of mine, and I used to be with Park Service. Okay. Five, six years. Um, <clears throat> Jim said, now Garnet, you know you've got to have another source on this. The maps aren't going to do it. You need a diary. You need something right. like that. Said, All right. So I'm out to uh, have had some Civil War arms in the past, so I'm at one of these gun shows, and there is a bunch of books sitting on the table, and I look to see if there's anything on Lookout Mountain, and I find one, and I open it, and lo and behold, one of the soldiers, you know, they came in waves around uh -huh. like this, and all they really wanted to do, as you said, was get access into right. Chattanooga, so they stopped here overnight once they got to Craven's house up there. And uh, there's this young man, a northerner, who's come all the way through and is in a ditch, essentially the one that they dug, right. uh, and a big yellow dog jumps in the ditch, and he's in the ditch, and it's part of the diary. And I got Ogden out here, and I said, well, Jim, don't you think this has got to be it? He said, okay, Garnet, you got me on that. <laughs> That's a good uh, feeling when you get Jim Ogden to admit that, too. Yeah, yeah, Jim is a great guy. Uh, just one other note. this. I developed all the signage. Okay. I paid for it, but uh, someone else in the family hadn't maintained it. Um, it's my mother and father standing there at the... In the picture? Uh, in the picture. Oh. My mother's going down in a 55-gallon drum, and she's wearing <laughs> okay. a flight jacket from her Women's Air Force Service pilot rating. My dad is right next to him, and my Uncle Garnet, who okay. is my namesake, is standing right there to the right. And so I think he brought it back in the 20s. Well, that's... Very cool. That's really ditch. It's down, well, it's right down below here. I believe uh, the line probably went right up that ravine there. And, uh, the one, uh, I'm told not to tell anyone exactly where this is. I don't blame uh, John Wilson, who's a great historian. We were looking for the uh, part of the road that actually had the macadam for the. Right stuff on okay, it. And I had found what I thought was a gun position right overlooking the river. Mm -hmm. And so I said, John, that road's got to come right through here. And we walked out in the woods and I can tell you exactly where it is. I don't want to say exactly where <laughs> But the roadbed, the original Macadam roadbed is right there and it goes right past this gun position that uh, is now recorded as part of the park. I said, that's really cool. Have we ever done this in a public program? And he said, no, because there's not good parking. And I said, we're going to make it work. That's why you guys are all crammed down there in a weird parking situation. But if you will flip to your picture here, this is one of the more iconic photographs taken around Chattanooga during the Civil War. Um, it's on the Library of Congress website if anybody really wants to download that in mega high resolution. This is my plug for the Library of Congress website. Um, on there you can download photographs that are in the public domain. Um, those of you guys that know stuff about image files and stuff, you can pull two, three hundred megabyte TIFF files down. Um, it's pretty stellar. Um, and this picture is labeled Rebel Works on Lookout Mountain. And so if you look kind of at the bottom left, you kind of see the little wall that's there. You can see the little logs that are holding. You see the gun fork cut out. You can see uh, the Tennessee River out behind them with Moccasin Bend. And so, I don't really have a cool story with this other than to go, look at your picture, now look at that earth wall right there. <laughs> and that's just cool. And I'm not going to talk really about that other than to say, that's cool and I'm going to step out of the way so you guys can see. Yeah, so, if, you kinda, if you're not sure, so I was about to say the tree in front of us, that's not a very good description. But, kind of right here in front of me where the bird just flew past, Look right here, there's kind of this little earthen wall. Um, yeah, and, and it kind of almost makes that little corner L shape a little bit. And if you look at your picture, that's there for That's a pretty rare thing for us to be able to have, not just at this battlefield, but in, especially this battlefield, but really in any battlefield where you can find a very correct photograph of some sort of fortification and then still be able to see that exact spot. Now, we don't know exactly of uh, when or where um, this got uh, was constructed. We know that it's Confederate. We know
note, or our suspicion is most likely this is before the Battle of Chickamauga. So this would have been built um, by the Confederates wanting to kind of guard this road, but also trying to guard um, the, the, the rail lines at the base of the mountain. Um, the reason we don't think this fortification would have been built during the siege of Chattanooga is going to be the subject of our next stop. But again, this is kind of just a big thing that I just want to say. And I, I, I usually, those of you guys that have been on tours with me, you know that I've always got some sort of a cool story or like, oh my gosh, here's this emotional moment. No, this is just a cool, hey, look at that, look at that. So, is in a slightly different position now than what it would have been in 1863, which makes lining up, and you, know, uh, you said you would try to do some, some lining up, we're going to go with some uh, lining up of historic maps and photographs, these down there, that makes it really difficult to do because it's not the same spot. Because we got an interstate and a Cummins Highway behind us. Now, one of the things uh, that's about the spot we're at um, that's super terrifying um, and it's going to make everybody want to go step like three feet that way is uh, it's, it's basically a straight drop almost all the way down to the river right underneath us. Um, we're kind of on, it's not a bridge necessarily, but it's kind of a bridge. Oh, thanks guys. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and even like Cummins Highway and stuff is built kind of over the top of this gaping chasm that you don't realize that you're on until you go out to Moccasin Bend and look up. But that's a great transition point to talk about why this road becomes so important as it turns out, not just for the Union Army, but for the Confederates during the Civil War. So the Union Army, they're trapped in October of 1863 out in the city of Chattanooga. Their supply base is back this direction, Bridgeport, which you said just a little while ago. Well, the Confederates are trying to control this line that goes from Missionary Ridge, which we can see on the other side of the city through the trees here, up here to Lookout Mountain, and then out into Lookout Valley, which we can kind of start to see parts of Lookout Valley straight ahead that way. The Confederates need to be able to have soldiers positioned both on this side of the mountain and on that side of the mountain. What's the way to get between the two? This road. That hill over on Moccasin Bend is going to be a problem if you're a Confederate soldier in the fall of 1863. And if you don't believe me, we're going to take a Confederate soldier's word for it. Uh, Mr. William Talley of Havis' Georgia Battery is going to describe this spot for us, where we're gathered. Um, so Havis' Georgia Battery, to get you guys oriented, so this is during the siege. They're actually over on Missionary Ridge, but he's going to describe this for us. He says, we camped at the foot of Missionary Ridge some time. Rations for men and horses were very scarce on account of the roads to Chickamauga Station were almost impassable with a team of wagons. Listen to this part. There was corn on the other side of Lookout Mountain. So he's over there at Missionary Ridge, food over there. How are you going to get the food? <laughs> right here. Oh, on the other side of Lookout Mountain along the Tennessee River. But wagons could not go over there. The only road across the mountain was on the side over the Tennessee River. The river at the bottom, some hundred feet above the river, the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad ran along a ledge of the mountain, some 200 feet above the river, then for 200 feet perpendicular was the road on a ledge, but most of the way was on a slope of the mountain and had been cut down to make the road and undergrowth was thick. He doesn't use periods and commas. Sorry about that. I'll do the best I can to try to make it a little bit more uh, uh, readable here for us. Let's see. He says the undergrowth was thick and the road could not be seen from across the river at the Moccasin Point. That hill right there, right in front of us. Right where the river made a bend, Moccasin Bend as it is known. Sometimes, or places, it was straight down for over 100 feet to the railroad, or 200 feet or more straight up. Opposite the Yankee Fort, for about 20 yards, the road was in plain view of the guns across the river. 
So we do this in the winter time because there's no trees and vegetation up. But right about here, where there's kind of this gaping chasm underneath this, this is open. The road had been dug out of the mountain and, large, and a large rock was left leaning to the road. The water had washed a gully from about three feet from this overhanging rock down, then across the, then across the road and way down you could see the railroad on down and below the river. To get corn from over the mountain, men were sent on horseback with a sack apiece and they would bring a sack of corn in front of their saddles. So to get food, Confederates out of Missionary Ridge were having to load up on horses and ride this road. Now it's mostly safe until you get to right here with this rock bluff. And they didn't use boats because they didn't have boats Second part there, too much of a sitting target. He says, I was detailed one day to go after corn with a lot of others. Just before we got to the overhanging rock, we stopped in the bushes. So right about the point where we got to the curve right there. He says, let's see, we got to the bushes and dismounted. And one man would lead his horse and go across for fear the Yanks would shoot at them. We got across and got our sacks of corn and got to the place of the overhanging rock. The man ahead of me was riding a mule and said he was going to ride across, so I gave him time to get across and started. As I came out in the open, there was that fellow. His mule had shied at the open fall. That's this opening right underneath us that if anybody's feeling really saucy when you walk by, just kind of do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that again. All right. <coughs> at the open fall on the railroad, and it jammed his sack of corn against the rock and the sack it caught his leg towards the saddle and he could neither go forward nor backwards and i was scared to death nearly up was hundreds of feet of hundreds of feet perpendicular uh down was the same and across the river i looked into the mouths of the guns almost every second uh i looked every second to see the puff of smoke but they didn't shoot and then the man behind me came out of there and there was three of us. About that time I saw number one got his leg out and he hit the ground running and I was right behind him. I was detailed to go after corn the next day, but a boy who was on guard wanted to go and offered to swap places with me and I needed no one to advise me. So I swapped and stood guard all day and night on two hours and off four hours. That PM when my men got to that overhanging rock, the Yanks shot a shell at him, but it struck about 10 feet above him and he was not hurt. So, one of the most common questions visitors have to Lookout Mountain Battlefield um, is how in the world do the Confederates lose here when they have this mountain? And the answer is this stretch of road that we're on right now, pretty much within the space that we're gathered. Because across that hillside, as the Confederates find out, it's not going to be Lookout Mountain that's the defining geographic feature to this region. It's that peninsula there, Moccasin Bend. This is going to be the key to Chattanooga. I'm going to use an analogy here, and I can't claim to have come up with this. One of our other park rangers did. Let me get you to stand up for me. Let me get you get your help here. Step forward here. Okay, so, what's your name, by the way? Philip. Philip. I knew that. You come on a ton of tours. I didn't know your name. Philip. All right, so Philip is the Confederate, since he's got gray on. All right, so Philip, my hand is Moccasin Ben. Now try to attack me. Okay. We got it figured. Don't do that or you might fall. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't win. win. Yeah. All right. That hand is Moccasin Bend. The guns across there, um, they have both They have both 10-pound uh, Parrot rifles, three-inch ordnance rifles, which have ranges of two and three miles, and we're less than a mile to the top of that hill. And they can use this rock face right here, right as the road comes into the open, is basically a targeting grid and they can just have that rock zeroed in. And the moment you see a single person walking across, boom. And you're just far enough away where the shell would explode on the rock behind you and then you'd hear the cannon go off. That's just enough to make this probably, the to me, the most terrifying patch of ground in Chattanooga. And ultimately what happens is the Confederates are unable to get enough reinforcements into Lookout Valley because they're not gonna risk running columns of troops on this road. They can't get enough troops out to Lookout Valley, and that is what ultimately leads to, and I was asking about this earlier, the Union victory at Brown's Ferry and opening up the a second supply route um, out across Moccasin Bend. Without those guns out on Moccasin Bend, this stretch of road would just be 
clogged with Confederate soldiers. Earlier we said the whole core of the Union Army comes through here. Without the guns on Moccasin Man, this is clogged with Confederates. And so, as we think about this place, it's kind of forgotten. I mean, most people that are even big Civil War buffs here in Chattanooga have never been on this road, have never really heard this story. What's cool about it is it's one of the few places, one of the few, few stories that we can tell and actually kind of walk to a spot and say, yeah, that's probably right here where the big gaping chasm is. Or we can go to that earthwork and say, here's this. Um, but the story of this road doesn't end here. But I'm going to try to end just a little bit because I see these dark clouds rolling in and I know you guys want to stay dry. Um, but the story of this road doesn't end. Ultimately, this road gets replaced by Cummins Highway and eventually I-24 down beneath us. But as recently as the 1930s, this was still the late 20s and early 30s, this was still the major thoroughfare to get from east to west. Now, anybody got a good guess what people say in the 1920s and 30s people in Chattanooga might be wanting to get hold of that they've got out in Lookout Valley? Anybody got a good fun guess on this one? Hey, there we go. I like the way you think. I was originally going to be, as I was walking this earlier, I found somebody had left a, a, a trash bottle of whiskey sitting around. We were going to use that as a prop, but then I figured y'all wouldn't believe that I didn't drink it. So there you go. You have to come on all my tours now for personal stories. Right? So during kind of the early period of prohibition, now Tennessee and, and locally, they had kind of passed some laws before national prohibition happened. But moonshining is big on Sand Mountain. No comment. As a federal employee, I'm not going to get into who's shining and who's not. I am not a revenue. So, oh Lord, you're videoing that too. Yeah, right. I get beat up somewhere. But the city of Chattanooga, there's a lot of bars in Chattanooga and even, even you know, speakeasies and stuff. And so, how do you get the booze from Sand Mountain to there? this road right here and in fact this road is the scene of actually a couple of shootouts um, and so um, interestingly and I put a link to this on the back page of your packet there if anybody wants to read it uh, the local paper the Times Free Press back in December actually ran a story about some of the moonshiners um, that were here on the old Wahatchee Pike but um but to just kind of give you a, a little bit of a um, uh, a little bit of a tease here with it um, Chattanooga police would use this road as a block as basically they blockade this road they'd run like roadblocks here this is a really easy road to roadblock. I can stand here and stop anything, right? Um, and so, uh, but as kind of the Confederates, you know, just like the Confederates found out, this is also an easy road to choke off. And so, um, actually in 1919, a little bit, you know, right about the time this is all happening, um, there's actually three bootleggers are killed here on the Wahatchee Pike. Um, you got their names too. One guy's name is Fitney Chun. That's a great name. Um, he was killed in, a, in a, a dispute with his partner here on the road. And the other two, a guy named Wiley Thomas and a guy named Rube Love, were killed on the pike in altercations with law enforcement related to moonshining. Um, most likely a little bit more down towards the, the, the uh, San Omo end, um, not right here where we're at. But again, this road has got so many different um, kind of layers of stories here. And even though this road is no longer active, even though this is not a road you can drive on anymore, the story of this road still kind of continues through its replacements. Because this road could be easily choked off, it could back up the wagons, it could back up the troops, well, we can still experience that today. And if anybody's going to get on I-24 West today, you're going to experience that today. Sorry guys, just that's I-24 West. Um, and so, again, to me, that's, this is, that's what makes this Wahatchee Pike area so cool is that is that again, we can still kind of experience how geography affects transportation. Even though we aren't on this road anymore, that road still has the same problems. The road beneath it still has the same problems. Whatever you do, don't look down. I'm more than happy to, to stand around and chat, answer questions, um, particularly while we're filing cars out. So. Well, guys, hope you enjoyed this little video. I'm off to go on some more journeys, so until then, why don't you go on some journeys of your own? We'll see you next time. <laughs>